Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Very pleased to welcome back to Forward Guidance my friend Lawrence McDonald, New York Times bestselling author and publisher of the Bear Traps Report. Uh, Larry is the author of the brand new book, When Markets Speak, which I read, I enjoyed. Larry, your previous book was more about looking back at, at history at collapse of Lehman Brothers. This is looking forward about what the next decade and decades are going to, to be like and how they're going to be nothing like what you and I have experienced over the past decades, disinflation, uh, expanding central bank balance sheets, a unipolar world. Larry, just paint a picture for the audience of how you imagine the next few decades are going to be like in the world of, of macro and why that's going to matter for investors and really everybody. Really appreciate the shout out. Um, one of the things about this book is we run a conversation on Bloomberg with institutional investors in 30 countries. And over the last 10 years, we work with professional investors, hedge funds, mutual funds, pension fund managers around the world. And what, what I'm trying to do with this book is democratize information. That's why you've got to read this book, because if you want to know what really happens behind the scenes, how we formulate ideas, um, mosaic research, Jack, is like taking a piece of information or a thesis and then surrounding it with other pieces of information to make it stronger or weaker, right? So you can identify weaker a weaker investment thesis versus a strong one. And what I've noticed in the chat the last you know, two, two, three, four years is the amount of people that are focused on a more sustained inflationary regime that are really smart investors that we trust and we know, that group of people is growing. So there's more people in the conversation. This is like an institutional chat, a conversation. It's like a live ideas dinner. And that's our business, the Bear Trap Support. And the more people are looking at hard assets versus financial assets. So they're looking at uranium, oil and gas, metal, all kinds of different metals in the types of metals that will basically be the foundation for our future in terms of our power grid, in terms of our energy sources, uh, in terms of how we actually you know, fulfill a lot of these expectations like artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence like we can get into. And so if you already you know, ask the top two or three or, or, or more reasons for this inflationary epoch that you imagine going forward, why is inflation going to be high and stay high? You know, inflation peaked in the U.S. around 9%. It's now at 3%, giving a lot of wind to the sales of the disinflationists. Number one, I mean, how high do you think inflation is going to sort of stabilize at? Are we talking 4%? 5%. And again, back to my first question, what are the major reasons for why this will be uh, inflationary time ahead? So in my first book, it's now in 12 languages. It's a New York Times bestseller, a colossal failure of common sense. It was voted as a top 20 all time, all time at the CFA Institute, top 20 book. Very and good. So, I enjoyed it. I read it. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And, and so that's the reason why that's important is when I was at Lehman, I was a trader in the high yield distress businesses. And the fiscal and monetary response, Jack, to Lehman Brothers, right, was about $4 trillion. And that's fiscal and monetary response. Uh, we had an austerity period after the 2012 election where, you know, Republicans and a lot of people on the Hill were really responsible around spending, right? Or overly, as someone, some people would say, uh, and not responsible. And so, some people would say like over, you know, I guess too much for too much response. What do you want to say? It was a austerity regime and you you at in the US, we had an austerity regime in don't forget Greece, right? So we had all these austerity regimes. And you know, now yeah. we're in a period after COVID, think of COVID and the Inflation Reduction Act, what you, everything that's come out of Washington, fiscal and monetary response is 16 trillion. So Lehman Brothers, four trillion, 16 trillion fiscal and monetary. And then we have a more multipolar world. So not only do we have, you know, four times the fiscal and monetary um, in terms of trillions of dollars more, but we also have a more multipolar world, a, a world with more conflicts where the people don't trust the supply chains anymore. People want to reshore. Companies want to reshore. The Biden team saw what Trump did with, you know, kind of reshoring and bringing manufacturing back and promising to bring those jobs back. Uh, Biden's basically picked up the Trump torch in that regard. 
you see, you see that's what what that's what some of this some of this chip, semiconductor uh, that led the chips led legislation you know, all these different many different types of legislation that are just attempting to reshore jobs because of this populist movement in the United States all of that's inflationary and if Trump wins the next election you know tariffs Biden kept the Trump tariffs that's inflationary right uh, the power of labor labor unions are I think two to three times stronger today than they were say 2010 11 12 13. so you've got all these sources of sustained inflation that are coming at us and now you have in a multipolar world more conflicts we've got two wars and neil ferguson when i sat down with him years ago he's the one that opened my eyes to this he said larry wars are the most like think of the vietnam war wars are inflationary we had that incredible inflation in the 70s and so we've got drones jack drones that are taking out ships in the Zoids Canal. They're taking out two to three, four refineries in Russia in the last, you know, couple in the last month. And so all of those things are inflationary. So we're coming into this more sustained inflation regime. That's why you gotta read this book, When Markets Speak, because trillions of dollars, we're looking talking about a multi-trillion dollar migration of capital, and nobody's prepared for it. A migration of multi-trillion migration of capital from where to where, Larry? In this time that you envision of high inflation, what assets perform well and which don't perform well? Think about the last commodity bull market, say 2008, 2014. Um, at one point, the energy sector was the same size as the NASDAQ 100. So the en energy sector was about the same size as the NASDAQ 100. Today, the NASDAQ 100 is 18 trillion larger. Okay, 18 trillion larger than... The energy sector, Nvidia itself is five percent of the S and P. That's an artificial intelligence. Five percent of the S and P. The energy sector is three percent of the S and P. And so, everybody's long what we call financial assets. They're long growth stocks. Nobody's really long hard assets or commodities. They're massively underowned because everybody's looking back at the previous regime. Everybody's looking back at Lehman and COVID in that period of disinflation in the post Lehman world. And now we're coming into a, like a 1968 to 1981 regime where different asset classes outperform. So you think that hard assets and commodities and commodity like stocks like energy will will outperform and beat growth stocks and correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. So the, the major drivers of this inflationary period that you see ahead of us is strong, you know, strong labor, very robust fiscal and monetary stimulus, so basically money printing, specifically from you know the, the government, a multipolar world. What do you mean by a multipolar world? And then also, does it have to do with reshoring? Basically, making stuff in the U.S. is more expensive than making things in China. And over the past 30 years, we've seen the, the proliferation of global, globalization, which has been disinflationary because uh, you know countries with very low costs have been producing more and more stuff. And you, you envision a, a re reversal of that. Is that right? Yeah, well, think about COVID, right? COVID burnt, the supply chain chains broke down. So right there, uh, thousands of CFOs around the, the United States, around the world, were burnt. And they were because they didn't have a backup supply chain. They didn't, they basically were too um, tied into, it was complacency, massive complacency where they were too complacent around, okay, these supply chains are going to be smooth as silk for a long period of time. That's de deflationary. In a, in, a, in a world where the supply chains, like think of what's happening in the Suez Canal, think of what's happening with the Panama Canal now with just the water tables, think of what's happening all around the world. It, it's the supply chains just aren't working as well. And not only that, we've decimated the, the, the Rust Belt in the United States. We've taken 5 million jobs out of the United States and we've sent them all over the world to India, Bangladesh, China. And so we've raised that standard of living around the world and so energy consumption globally, I mean, if you're in India in a call center, you might make 10, 20 times more than your great, big, great, big, sorry, your great grandparents. So your energy supply has been, been constrained by lack of investment, by ESG and things like that, which, and, and, and just regulation. So your supply of, of energy and metals has been suppressed. And, but your demand, which comes from, you know, country like, like, like I said, countries like India, your, your demand is really exploding. And we're, we, we, we've calculated if, if you take the 2010 to 2014 regime of, of what we call, you know, commodity bull market and investment, 
we're about three trillion dollars behind that previous path, and and so that's you know pretty daunting. And and the last thing is this: just that the stocks you want to own. This way, you have to buy this book when markets peak because the stocks you wanted to own, the stocks that commanded the larger part of the market in say the 60s, 70s, 80s, each decade have been very different. And so in disinflationary regimes, your big cap growth stocks. You know, your Apples, your Microsofts, they t- typically do really well in disinflationary inflationary regimes. Whereas in, in inflationary regimes, you know, your General Electrics, your industrials, uh, some of your oil and gas, you know, Exxon was the largest, largest kid on the block for a long time. And so the makeup of the market changes dramatically over the last like 50 years. And we think we're on the cusp of a colossal migration of capital based on that shift. Let's, how high do you think the prices of commodities can can get for you know for example oil the peak in 2008 was about 140 dollars i think now it's at 80 dollars which is high but you know still below below there copper you know it's pretty close to its its peak it's about at about four bucks how high do you think that they they go you know gold now over two thousand dollars an ounce how high do you think they go and uh how long do you think they last because also, I'm curious if you agree with this. I mean, commodity bull, bull markets are, by their very nature, transitory in the same in the same way that you know nothing lasts forever. But also, if copper goes to ten dollars, probably there's going to be a huge investment boom in copper, and then pretty soon it's not going to be at ten dollars anymore. It's going to be you know, and, 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 and often basically the point of typically shortages create oversupply, and you know we may have seen that in, in oil at least cyclically, where you know you had a huge spike up to $120 uh, in 2022. And it's since gone down there a little bit as US production has gone down. So you know, what, what is sort of the scale of this commodity bull market that you envision in terms of how high things go, pick the commodity you want? I mean, we didn't talk about uranium yet, uh, and how long it lasts? Well, everybody's 401k, like the entire 401k ecosystems of, of America, that system is massively long, the same trade. Everybody's in the same stocks, everybody's in growth. And when you think about commodity bull markets, it's like turning around an aircraft carrier. You know, if you just think about CFOs in the natural gas space, chief financial officers in, say, the copper space, they've all been like, they just saw their last five bosses get shot because the investments that they made said from the from 2000, say, 10, 11, 12, you know, to, to 14, you had a pretty incredible bull market in commodities. Then there was overinvestment and a lot of these CFOs today saw their previous bosses get shot. So we're massively underinvested in, 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 say, copper, oil, and gas. There's a lot more capital discipline. And on top of that, the politics. I mean, just look at Panama. Panama has one of the most, this first quantum company, this is one of the most incredible copper mines in the world. You can get copper out of the ground, you know, to the ocean from the, from the mine very fast. And whereas in other parts of the world, like in Africa, it takes a long time. The politics of Panama shut that mine down. And it's one of the most p- profitable, productive mines in the world. I'm seeing the same thing in Chile, same thing in Peru, which to some extent, not, not, not the same violence. But it's just, you've got this suppression of investment through regulation, through, um, through really intimidation, politically bad politics. And so to, to, that's, why you, that's why these commodity bull markets, Jack, can run for like five to to, t- to t- you know, I think three to eight years because to get that uranium, to get that oil and gas, I mean, it's going to take at least at least three. The case we make in the book, at least three trillion of investments across all those areas. I mean, just look at artificial intelligence. I mean, we have a fifty-year-old power grid in the United States in some spots, thirty years old in others, and we're supposed to take artificial intelligence, which is just think about the computing power of these data centers. Um, you're talking about 460, 490 terawatt hours in 2022. And if you believe NVIDIA, if you believe their management team that's very boastful, very aggressive pre- projections, if you believe the Wall Street analysts about artificial, artificial intelligence, then you're going to talk about energy demand or energy consumption going from 490 terawatt hours to 2,000. And on a power grid that that's, old, that's that old, the, and, and on solar and wind, no way. The only way to get through that is with gas and oil and gas and, and, and uranium and nuclear power. And what about coal? You know, met coal is more made for steel making. And so steel, 
is is very important. Uh, copper is the most important for the grid. Uh, but just think of the rebuild of the Ukraine. That's so. What's what's crazy is the rebuild of the Ukraine is going to basically coincide with this artificial intelligence boom. You know, this boom in crypto. You know, everybody loves to talk about crypto, but nobody's talking about the energy solution of the computing power needed when crypto gets up at a higher price. So yeah, so so steel. You know, you've got you, different types of steel. You've so, um, you're I'm sorry, different types of coal and different types of companies like Arch Coal and Arch Coal is more of a company that focuses on um, on, on, on coal that's used for, for, for electricity. And so, yeah, so coal stocks, would, they're, they're still extremely cheap relative to free cash flow. And so all these, all these plays really have, are, they're under-owned. ESG and regulation has dramatically forced, um, you know, a, a massive underinvestment and massive own, under-ownership of a lot of these asset classes. What kind of prices are you know, you think are ballpark for oil, which you know again the peak in two thousand eight was one hundred and forty. Copper, which is you know close to its peak at at four bucks. I mean, do you think we make all, new all time highs and they stay there? How far how far can this go? Well, oil itself, um, the uh, the underinvestment in oil and gas. Gas is some probably the most exciting right now. It's under two dollars, and gas is. I mean, with the LNG revolution around getting getting gas net getting LNG into Europe and just the old demand from artificial intelligence gas should be go from two dollars to eight dollars over like the next like five six years and so you talk about natural gas not not gasoline just to be clear yeah natural gas and then you're talking about oil I mean oil the last time right now the NIC if you think of like the last like couple months the Nikkei was at all-time highs um, the Italian stock has changed and the French stock has changed were pretty much near all-time highs the last time those markets were at all time highs, gold was, I'm sorry, uh, oil was like $140 a barrel. And you've got, you know, there's a billion people in India that don't have air conditioning. If you do, you know, we've done a lot of work in the book when markets speak around diesel demand in India, moped sales last year, fourth quarter. I mean, if you're a young person in, in India and you've, you, you raised your standard of living, the Davos crowd, these guys, this is a horrific. Catas potentially catastrophic miscalculation. They've, like I said, they've taken five million jobs out of the United States. They wanted to globalize, right? These are globalists, okay? It's a good thing, right? They meant well, right? But catastrophic mistake because you've raised the standard of living in India. You've raised the standard of living in Africa. These are, you're creating massive carbon consumers, and these people can't afford. Um, you know, solar and wind yet. These 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 different countries. They they can they can move it in over slowly over time. So, gas and oil are going to fill that void. Uranium, um, nuclear power. We've been writing about that for years. The entire uranium sector, Jack, it's like forty forty eight billion dollars. I mean, that's like a that's like a bathroom rounding error inside of the Nvidia. You know, I mean, it's just a joke. And so, nuclear uranium probably triples from here. From here, so right, it's around a hundred dollars uh, USD, uh, maybe a little bit less than that. You think it goes to three hundred dollars? Yeah, over the next ten years, I think I get a very good shot at that. Uh, the, which, if you just look through the math on the amount of amount of plants coming back online, and in, in say Japan, and the amount of the situation in the United States in terms of, <clears throat> if you look at the the different legislation in the U.S., the, the, the you know, Washington is waking up to this problem. We have a big uranium production problem. And so there's going to be a massive rebuild. And so, and then there's going to be, I mean, nuclear is the most green fuel in the world. And so, and then, then if you look at, you know, copper, huge bull market coming, nickel, huge bull market, aluminum, aluminum's your kind of back, your cheaper source for uh, metals for say the, the grid, like I said, the, the grid alone is a $2 trillion project. And then you have this re rebuild in the Ukraine. And so you've got this just colossal amount of demand coming the next 10 years. And aluminum is a big winner in any kind of rebuild in Europe. If, if copper is too expensive, then aluminum comes in on the grid. And so that's where I see just tr tremendous opportunities. So you're a massive commodity bull. And it sounds like you think that India over the next decade is kind of going to be like China was from 2000 to uh, 2008 in terms of just devouring a tremendous amount of commodities to fuel its investment-led growth model and uh, building buildings and that kind of stuff. Is that is that fair to say, Larry? 
Yes. I mean, like I said, we've taken the 5 million jobs out of the United States. We've decimated the Rust Belt. There are fathers in the Midwest that their, their father, their grandfather, their great grandfather all worked at General Motors. You know, and now they're working in restaurants and they're or they're go, going to the library at home. They're embarrassed or they're on disability. I mean, opioid this. Just look at Jack. Look at life. W- look at what the United States spends on health care. We literally like two standard deviations greater than any country on Earth and life expectancy in many parts. And we looked at this carefully in the book, life expectancy in, in the Rust Belt and the many of these states that Trump won. Um, life expectancy has gone down, Jack, down, because people are dying in their 50s because they 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 can't make enough money to support their family after inflation and taxes, or they lost their job, or they, they can get a job, but it's in a totally different industry than they've been accustomed to. And so you've emasculated the middle class in the United States. That's what inflation does, right? And so that creates you know just this really difficult environment for a lot of people that make, you know, less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, less than seventy thousand dollars a year. And so that that's created this the the political all this political push from both Biden and Trump to bring jobs back to the United States, which is inflationary. And how does this affect China, who has been producing a a tremendous amount of low cost goods for the rest of the world and amassed a huge surplus of currency reserves as it ran a, a trade surplus, a current account surplus. They used to invest that in U.S. treasuries. If the rest of the world is reshoring, what is the future of China's economic growth model or how, how might it have to change if it's no longer going to be producing so many of the stuff that you know is now going to be made in, in Europe or the U.S.? That's why China has been in some, you know, had a problem the last couple of years because this is, we've started, that's why look, just look at Mexico, right? Look at the, the peso. Uh, you can see that we're starting to create a backup supply chain. Andre Estefes talks about this in our book. So Andre said, you know, the, the east west the east west supply chain that was incredibly fluid um, after COVID and after a multipolar world, the Suez Canal. You've got drone attacks in the Suez Canal. Um, all these things in a multipolar world where it's more global conflict, less friendly sea lanes. Um, it's more inflationary, and so. China, we've already seen so far Mexico benefit from this potential. Andre Estefes in, in my book talks about a north-south supply chain that backs up the east-west. So basically the, the world got too addicted to an east-west supply chain. And so that's hurting China. That's why if you look at Latin American uh, ETF, if you look at ETFs that just focus on, focus on Latin, uh, they're dramatically outperforming China. Um, but in, the theory is that China is going, going to say in reinvest at home and less in infrastructure and more, you know, try to cons- try to cre- create a real consumer-based economy. And that handoff is is kind of unknown whether or not they're going to be able to pull it off. And that's what's causing, that's one of the things that's causing this massive um, underinvestment to the last year and a half. Or de- I guess, you know, de- de-investment, I guess, I guess people moving away from, from China. Right. So you said uh, Latin American stocks are outperforming China. I imagine a huge reason that is just the Chinese stocks have been in a brutal, brutal bear market to any, you know, anyone trying to pick a, pick a dip has just gotten uh, uh, d- destroyed. Uh, and so some of the companies look, you know, at least optically cheap. A, a lot of folks are worried about a Chinese uh, recession where even though growth looks good now and real growth looks good, their building and their investment in real estate has really slowed down. And their economy has been very dependent upon upon that. What are your thoughts on on that? And I mean, do you think China will be successful in attempting to move towards a more consumption driven growth model, where the savings rate basically goes down and its its citizens save less money and they spend more of it, which will fuel growth, instead of having to have them save money and then you know funnel that to the government or banks, which then invest in real estate projects, which are getting increasingly unproductive. Yeah, so China's a tough one because the contrarian in me, and we run a Bloomberg chat with institutional investors in about 20 countries, and there's a, a number of investors that were really bearish on China that are now bullish because just because the lack of the underinvestment is so off the charts. I mean, I know personally a couple of different fund managers that 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 run portfolios, uh, major portfolios that, that people know about and are very well high-branded names. 
And so when they go over to Europe or they go to conferences, normally there's like, you know, standing room only, they run out of coffee and muffins. And now, you know, my friend just got back from Europe and he, and he runs a China fund and he's like, you know, there's four people in the room and they've <laughs> the, got plenty of bagels, muffins and coffee. So it's, it's, it's tough because it's 14 trillion of GDP and it is growing, just not growing as, as fast, but it's hard to calculate you know, the, the rate of the rate of growth because nobody can trust the data. Um, but these companies are just so cheap. I mean, and that's why Charlie Munger was, before he passed away, of looking at stocks like Alibaba. I mean, one point in the last year, you could fit 14 Babas in Apple. And people are talking about like, oh, there's, 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 there's China economic risk to, to Alibaba. I mean, who are you kidding? I mean, Apple does $20 billion uh, a quarter of sales in, in China, 80 billion a year. And that, that's actually down 3% year over year. So Apple's performance over the last couple of months, which is really bad, Apple started to really, that whole China thing is starting to catch up with Apple. And then if you look at NVIDIA, the whole invasion of Taiwan thing uh, from China has been out there and everybody talks about it. But there doesn't have to be an invasion. China just could literally create a naval blockade. And NVIDIA, like NVIDIA's got all this technology, like I said, 5%, think about passive investing, how dangerous, 5% of all American IRAs, there's $35 trillion, Jack, in that's tied to passive investing, maybe more, probably more, if you calculate, depending on how you calculate it. And it's 5% of the S&P is in NVIDIA, which is trading at crazy valuations, you know, 82% above its 200-day moving average, and 5% of everybody's retirement account is in NVIDIA that is massively exposed to, it's a, it's a fabulous company, a semiconductor maker. So if something would ever happen in Taiwan, NVIDIA would get cut down by 60, 70, 80%. And China doesn't have to invade, they just have to maybe, okay, they maybe they get just concerned about the amount of technology that is coming out of Taiwan and helping the United States. I mean, if you were China, wouldn't you, you know, at some point, potentially want to do something about that if the US is really gaining a technical technological advantage. So they could create all they could create a sea lane uh, restrictions or they can try to create all kinds of restrictions on what type of technology is coming out of Taiwan. That's probably the first thing you do before you invade, right? Larry, is is NVIDIA a bubble? Well, the point of my book is the Bitcoin NVIDIA thing is pure idiocy because it just doesn't work without a power grid. It doesn't work without a, a very cheap energy source, and so artificial. It's it's just like the the it's just like the dot com thing. I I created a website. We talked about this in my first book, but my partner Steve Seifel and I we created convertbond.com. We were lucky enough in the '90s to sell it to Morgan Stanley, and it was a, it was a nice transaction. But you know, back then the most obvious trades, Jack, that all the young people and all my almost every investor was involved in, were the obvious trades like Lucent. JDS Uniphase, Cisco, and Global Crossing. And these companies um, were like the obvious trades, like just like the way NVIDIA is today. But it's the it's the second and third tier trades that nobody feels like, like natural gas or like biotechs, companies that are going to benefit from this new artificial intelligence reg re you know, revolution. So is it a bubble? Yeah, it's a bubble in the sense that everybody's crowded into the most obvious trades and nobody really owns the trades that are going to benefit from artificial intelligence for the next 10 years. NVIDIA has doubled its, its revenues. At what point did NVIDIA become a rebel or excuse me, a bubble? Because it you know, went to 400, it looked overvalued, but then it, it doubled, doubles its, its revenue. So, I mean, do you think that it will just, the spectacular growth will, 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 will stop. And I guess you, you kind of think it's the poster child for speculative activity in growth stocks, which are overvalued relative to commodities. The NVIDIA management team is famous for, I mean, these guys are pump artists. They were, they literally two years ago, the conference call, not even, a year, first of all, they didn't buy any of their stock a year ago. And the first, you look at the fourth quarter of 20, um, say first quarter of 23, fourth quarter of 22, very little stock. Um, and so they were pumping meta chips. They were pumping crypto chips a year and a half, two years ago. No mention, you know, no mention of artificial intelligence. And so now they tend, they're, you got to be very careful with these guys. They tend to very, 
over pump a upside of a bull market, which is fine. A lot of a lot of companies do that, but that's what they do. And so when you pump up something like this, and then you look at the circular revenues that come, like if you look at Facebook, how much Facebook spent and how much of Facebook's CapEx, CapEx budget went to NVIDIA, it's very clear that these companies really aren't using these chips yet. They're just hoarding them because they want to prevent their competitors from getting an advantage in artificial intelligence. And so everybody's like trying to front run the other guy. And if, and if, and if, and if, and if um, electricity, if just look at electricity usage, you know, last like three, four months, we don't really see you know, a massive explosion yet in electricity usage from artificial intelligence yet. So you see it, but it's not like, it's nowhere near what NVIDIA's growth rate is. So <clears throat> there's clearly hoarding going on, and it's basically a circular thing where the fangs, certain members of the MAG-7 are like trying to front run the next one. And all the time, these, chip, chips, these chips get for a higher and higher price. It just incentivizes all the competition to invest so, but so their moat that everybody talks about is just going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. And at two point three trillion dollars, trading eighty two percent above the two hundred day moving average, Apple in its best day, Jack, in its best day, September two thousand twenty, when, when it was at two trillion. So don't don't think of it, Nvidia in a stock price, right? That's always think of it as like market cap. So when you get at two trillion, it's very difficult, Jack, because GDP is only certain size, right? It's very difficult when you get to two trillion dollars, or two point three trillion for Nvidia. So, to to the most Apple got above its two hundred day moving average when it was two trillion dollars was like fifty sixty three percent. And the most net uh, um, Amazon, Amazon got up to two trillion. Amazon, think about Tesla, never really reached two trillion. That was the big, you know, fair haired boy, right? So Amazon really never cracked two trillion. These are really great growth stocks, right? And so Amazon, the most it ever traded, Jack, above its 200-day moving average was 54%. And when it was that big, right? So my point is, when you have a $2.3 trillion company that's 80% above its 200-day, it's a screaming sell. It just literally, there's not enough. It's, it's all call buying. It's not real. It's not like real pension funds are buying it up there. It's just a bunch of speculators that are all trying to buy calls when you when someone buys a lot of, we have like 3,000 people in one day buy calls, to give you an example. You know, the, the street has to like buy stock to hedge. If, if you're a dealer, you get you get lifted on those calls and, and then you have to buy stock to hedge those calls. And so that creates this, this what we call this blow off top. And I think NVIDIA, remember two Fridays ago, NVIDIA had a $250 billion candle jack. That's from top to bottom in a day. In a day. I think it was like thir- within two days, it was like 13, 14%. And that, so over the period, it was even bigger. But the single day candle was like 240 billion. So that's n- nothing's even close to that. I mean, that's like the size of most, I mean, most of the, most of the companies in the S&P are less than that. Right? You know what I mean? So right. it, it's, just, it's just an obscene amount of speculation. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low-cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you could lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. Larry, I'm just kind of putting the puzzle pieces together. NVIDIA is 5% of the S&P 500. Apple, other tech stocks really dominate the S&P 500. As you say, energy, 3 to 4%, materials, you know, a small percentage of a fraction. So if, if the things that you think will outperform energy, gold miners, commodity producers are so small within everyone's investments, and th- that's gonna, those are going to do well, but they're small. So whereas so much of the S&P 500 is things you think might not do that well, you, you talked about NVIDIA, which you said is the screaming sell. Would that lead you to be bearish on the entire index? Uh, because what you think will underperform just is, is so large as a percentage of the index. And okay, great. You love you love energy stocks and you love gold miners. But what? There's one gold miner in the S&P 500 and there's 
you know, only a handful of energy companies and material copper producers and, and the like. Well, so think of the last time we had a, you know, multipolar world commodity bull market, 1968 to 81. So 1968 to 81, multipolar world, we had a commodity bull market in there. And so industrials, metals, oil and gas, uranium, that, those groups, materials, those groups were 49% of the S&P, 49. Now they're like 14. <laughs> so your industrials, your metals, your oil and gas, your materials, all those are like 14% of the S&P versus 49% in, uh, say, 1980, 81. So with the highest conviction, and that's why you have to buy this book to prepare yourself, we're probably going back to like, you know, 30% of the S&P, 32, not, not 49, but those groups are going to command a lar much larger percentage of the S&P. Um, and, and right now, and that, that's what we've seen, like in all crazy bull markets, like 2007, look how big the financials were mm -hmm. as a percentage of the S&P, 2007, 2008. They were enormous. I think it was like, and I think it was something like mid-20s. And so maybe mid to low 20s. And that's still an enormous amount for the financials. And so in different bull markets, energy at one point, one point important time was, you know, a very high percentage of the S&P. Like, like ExxonMobil was the largest stock in the S&P. So you have these periods where they go on for long periods of time. And we're, we're, we've gone through a very long, that's, that's my whole point in the book. We go through a very long deflationary, disinflationary period. And if inflation normalizes at 3 4 percent versus mm -hmm. one two that's what triggers you know a lot of this migration like i said it's not going to go to you're not going to see these things go back to 49 percent of the s p but mm -hmm. they go from 14 percent of the s p to 30 32 35 yeah so you said inflation settling out at three to four percent so mildly higher than the s i mean double the fed's target of, of two percent but you don't think that there will be sustained you know nine percent ten percent double digit inflation like we saw in the 1970s although that is of course possible in the book, I'm careful around that. I, I think it's possible, but there's a lot of factors, aging population in the world, aging population in China and certain countries that might prevent that crazy, you know, 9%, you know, it's a, well, a sustained 7%. And by the way, I mean, you look at history, civilizations break down after like, because pe people don't understand, like if you bought $100 worth of gro groceries in that 2019, uh, that you even though inflation's come down a little bit over last year, that hundred dollars of groceries in 2019 is like still 120, $125. So in other words, it breaks down a society. That's why the, the bottom 30% of Americans, the New York Fed told us they only have $400 in the checking account, right? And so the higher inflation goes, the, the more support you need. And it's one of the reasons why I look at these student loan things, right? So this is what we talk about in the book. If the government all of a sudden be giving student loans or providing, look at SNAP benefits, look at the percentage of Americans that are getting SNAP, that's, that's, that's food stamps. It was like three, 4% of Americans in say the nineties or even 2000. Now you're up near 13, 14% in some parts of the country. And so your, your social safety net in an inflationary regime um, for a whole bunch of different reasons gets a lot heavier. That creates more, demand for federal spending at the same time your interest costs are high. the bottom line is the only way to get out of a 35 trillion dollar hole where your social safety net is a lot larger uh, and your debts are that high 35 trillion dollar hole is what we call financial repression and that's what we talk about in our book when markets speak and it's no number one on amazon right now in finance and all the financial categories you gotta buy it today because what about, what's about to happen is this financial repression decade where the Fed's going to get forced to hold interest rates below the rate of inflation. And that's where you get, if, if you're holding your interest rates below the rate of inflation, that's where you get a very substantial, that's the way they get rid of the debt. So what we talk about in the book is, and you and I have talked about this in the past, debt jubilee. Mm -hmm. So you go back the last 3,000 years of civilizations, people get rid of debt by what we call debt jubilees. They just do a debt reset. The other way to, to, for a civilization to get out of this kind of hole is what we call financial repression. And that's where you, 
at some point the Fed gets forced to hold interest rates down. Where the, we're gonna have, by the end of this year, we're gonna have to go back to QE. So what we talk about in the book is we're gonna have to go from QT quantitative tightening to QE very fast because we've got less friends buying our bonds in the world. Uh, the U.S. economy is slowing down a little bit, but our interest costs are now eighty billion a month. Eighty billion a month. That's up from twenty-five billion a month two three years ago, and so eighty billion a month starts to to, to really eat up at a lot of the budget. And so at some point, the Fed gets forced in a financial repression where you're holding interest rates below inflation. And that's the way you get out of a $35 trillion debt hole. A $35 trillion, it's a very enormous hole, and you get out of it through financial repression or a debt jubilee. And the, the way that you get out of very high nominal debt is just by holding interest rates lower than inflation or lower than growth. So the denominator grows. And, you know, likewise, just to explain this to the audience, like people can put up a doom, a very scary looking chart of credit card debt in the US. But if you divide it by personal income or GDP or any sort of denominator, what used to be a very high level debt is, is now not so that, that you got to always adjust things. So so Larry, you know, I've had people come on my program, very smart people, and talk about this financial re repression uh, uh, narrative when interest rates were at zero and inflation was going up. They said, Oh, no, the Federal Reserve, they can't raise interest rates that much because there's just too much debt. But here we are at five and a half percent. You know, as as you notice, S and P stocks at all time highs. No, no imminent sign of crisis on on the fiscal front. Uh, if you think inflation is going to be at three to four percent, and you know the Fed Reserve is at now at five and three eighths percent on the Fed funds rate, likely you know has indicated that's going to do three cuts to below just below five uh, percent by the end of this year. Uh, what is the sort of real, i.e., inflation adjusted level of interest rates that would have to exist to to inflate away? Um, the debt, because let's say inflation is at three and a half percent. If interest rates are at three and a half percent, you're flat. Maybe that's not enough to inflate away the debt. Well, the modern monetary theory crowd, and I think Trump is a closet MM tier. They think that, yeah, if you do enough fiscal or if you do enough, say, tax cuts, this is another crazy thing about Trump. Um, Trump, if Trump wins the election, he wants to basically extend those tax cuts from 2017, tax cut 2017, I think they were passed. And so maybe 2018, but those tax cuts, if he extends them for 10 years, that's $350 billion. It's an, you know, a large, large amount of money. And so it, it just gets into a dynamic where, and then he wants to cut the, the corporate tax. So if you're, if you're growing it, if you somehow, if you were to be able to cut taxes or you will do a lot of fiscal spending, and you can grow at six, seven, well, I'd say consistently seven percent. You know that's one way to get out of this mess. It's, it's a big gamble because if if you do that, if you do it now, and you say that's what that's what Biden essentially is doing, but he's not doing it through tax cuts; he's doing it through spending. So there's two ways to do MMT: modern monetary theory. One is you know just juice your fiscal stimulus. I mean, Biden's doing two trillion a year of of deficit spending, which is almost 6% of the budget, you know, normally in a, in a peacetime, full employment, or not, I shouldn't say peacetime, but full employment, uh, that, that should be, you know, two, two to 3% of, of the budget. And so we're, we're, we're doing these, both, both presidents are potentially doing this gamble, uh, which is very dangerous because if you spend that much and you don't get the growth, then you go into a real financial repression regime. That financial repression regime you envision with, let's say, inflation is at three and a half percent. At what level of nominal interest rates would you call start calling financial repression? You know, two percent, i.e., negative real rates of one and a half percent. What do you What do you think? If inflation's four and real rates are, are three, mm -hmm. then you know, then you're in that neighborhood. But it's a very it's a very weird um, science because there's some historical data around it. But like picking like what is financial repression. The, the bottom line is that the definition is just holding rates below inflation. So just say so keeping rates at three when your inflation's four, and so there you're in. You know you're slow. You're slowly monetizing the debt. So the, the Federal Reserve indicated it plans on uh, three interest rate cuts this year. Would you say that what's currently priced into the forward interest rate market curve? You know, let's say with a with a two year is where it is. Do you think the Federal Reserve is going to go cut more or less than expected over the next one to two years? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. One is 
I, I think my, my big thesis that we talk about a little bit in the book, but I'm more confident now than ever. Uh, the oil market's pretty tight. The curve is in, the curve recently went in backwardation again. So your backwardation just means your front, your front months, your front months are higher than your outer months. The major thesis at the end of the book and the major thesis, I think it's going to play out this year where high conviction thesis in when market speak, speaks is that if the oil market's so tight and the labor market supposedly even a decent economy, especially in the high end where a lot of travel um, and you got a tight oil market, you can look at backwardation, the oil curve, and all that means that the front months more expensive than the other months that typically bullish seasonality is coming back. Oil Oil's performance between March and say September is pretty, very good. Uh, you get a summer driving season coming in and you've got global, global, a lot of global demand coming back. Um, so if you get a $20 move in oil because of where rates are and inflation expectations, all of a sudden all, everything around rate cuts now is, is comes into question because oil goes up, it's going to take up CPI again. So you have this big inflation revival that's where your interest rate sensitive stocks, like your regional banks, I think that there's, if you look at New York Community Bank, Jack, and we talk about this in the book, when markets speak, but the way they marked the book and the way the stock, you know, went to zero that fast, and same thing around Silicon Valley Bank, these banks just have horribly mismarked books. And right now, after the, what's happened at Silicon Valley Bank and New York Community Bank and all, Signature Bank, you've got regulators that have with egg on their face, Jack. And they're looking around the country for the next victims. And if, and if right now, if you just look at Comerica, you look at Zions, you look at a whole bunch of different banks, look at U.S. Bank Corp. All these banks have departments that are massively long commercial real estate, massively long mortgage-backed securities, all kinds of interest rate sensitive assets. And if rates don't come down, you've got CFOs and financial teams on these, in these organizations that have just been really begging the Fed for rate relief. It's one of the reasons why the Fed... You know, they've been turning dovish because they know they could create not a Lehman event, but definitely a, an SNL crisis event. And so that's the thing about oil is oil and drones p- potentially have a colossal impact on the banks because drone strikes hitting refineries, drone strikes, cr- you know, basically closing down transport in the Suez Canal, oil demand. You know, it's like a 1960s, 1980s world, multipolar. You get that move up in, in oil, and all of a sudden, the long end of the curve start. The Fed loses control of that, and next thing you know, if you have there's an Apple bond, Jack. You got to f- focus on this. There's an Apple bond that's backed by Apple, and it's it's a long duration bond, so it's long maturity. It's tra- it traded in the last like six months, nine months. It's traded. It's traded in the last six months and fifty six cents on the dollar because of duration. Yeah, but not. It's not credit. It's not credit. It's all duration, right? It's all duration. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Well, that's the problem with commercial real estate. You've got credit and duration. And so the, you're, you just have, if if you have that kind of an energy move, the probability that we lose a Comerica or a Zions and have another kind of banking crisis, is, I think it's pretty high. That is re- uh, really interesting, Larry. So there was a time when interest rates were at zero, when you know everyone who'd go on TV, not you, but you know, m- m- most people who go on TV to talk about banks said if interest rates rise, it would be good for banks because their loan yields would go up more than deposit costs. Because it would happen so fast and we went from zero to five and a half in you know, a-, a little over a year, but it seemed like the blink-, blink of an eye as opposed to the, the previous rate hiking cycle, which was very, very slow. A lot of banks' net in- in- interest income suffered. So do, so do you think that uh, basically... The correlation between bank stock, let's say, you know, a, a, a financial stocks ETF and a, a basket of, of, of banks and interest rates is basically uh, negative. In other words, it, as interest rates go up, the bank stocks go down. Yes. It's, well, so what we've seen, and we talk about this in the book, When Markets Speak, the performance of the banks this year. And remember, there's two different types of banks. The regional banks are tiny, right? But companies like U.S. Bank Corp are the fifth largest bank in the United States. And Comerica and Zions, these are not little tiny banks. But these banks, the performance of these banks since last January, so a little bit more than a year, you're underperforming the S&P by 50, between 30 to 50%. Like that's something you've never seen outside of a financial crisis. And I was in a meeting yesterday with a big hedge fund in New York. And I'm staying here at the Harvard Club, as I told you. 
uh, you know, we're doing events, I'm, I'm on the road. And so this dynamic is like, you know, you have banks that are mismarking their books. Um, there's a lot of interest rate stress there. And, and clients are talking about that. And they think that the regulators are going to go after this, this, this problem if rates don't come down. And so people are looking like hedge funds, pension funds, hedge funds are really starting to circle the wagons and the underperformance of the banks over the last, you know, 12 to 16 months speaks to, you know, this, 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 this piranhas of shorts coming in and they, they're trying to find the next victim. So Larry, if you're seeing a lot of inflationary pressure, which means that you know, spending and uh, investment, at least in nominal terms, will be pretty high, I think, uh, maybe in real terms, maybe not so much, but, but, it, but in, in nominal terms, it will be. Does that mean that you are uh, not that worried about a recession? Because you know, in a recession, inflation tends to fall or even go negative, as in the case of deflation. Uh, so you know, an inflationary decade maybe it's it's not a great time because prices are going up, but it would not be one in which there is a, you know, a deflationary recession almost by definition. Right. And that's that's exactly what's going on. Um, all the economists like Rosie, Lacey Hunt, I mean, these are great, great guys, and, and Raul Paul. And so Rosie and Lacey have been extremely bond bullish because they're thinking, they're, they're using that kind of recency bias where, if the economy starts to slow down a little bit in 2008, you know, that 2008 and also in, say, 2020, in both of those situations, the long end ripped and you get this incredible rally in bonds. Right. But this time around, because of, because the fiscal and monetary is 16 trillion versus four in the previous regime and because of all the things that are going on with labor unions and, like I said, multipolar world and in global conflicts with wars, you've got all this upward pressure. And so you're not getting that typical, as we soften, the economy softened a couple of times in the last year, and we didn't really get that big bond rally. Now, this is where you got to think about the 1980 style recession. So when a 1980 style recession is not that, is more like when inflation rips. See, right now inflation's ripped and it's hurting the bottom 50, 60% of people. You could see it in McDonald's numbers recently. You can see it in pet care. You can put so many companies, Dollar Tree stores. There's so many companies that are suffering. Kohl's, I mean, just company after company after company that sell products to the bottom 60%. But companies that sell products to the top 20%, 40%, 30%, uh, your Ferraris of the world, your LVMHs. I mean, these stocks have gone on incredible runs. Your American Express versus, say, Discover, these are huge divergences, huge divergences, right? So it's just boom, 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 where it's the top group is actually in a in a bull market economically. The bottom 60% are in a bear. But if inflation rips one more time, then what happens in like a 1980-style recession is it, it basically starts to move up from lower middle class to middle class and then eventually gets to the upper class So at some point. But you think about it, if you're in Palm Beach, Jack, Palm Beach, and you have, say, this is, you know, a high net worth person, but it's just to keep it simple, you had $10 million in a money market fund, right? Powell just gave you a three to 400% raise because you were getting 80, 70 to 80,000 a year in 2021. And now you're getting 500,000 a year, right? 450. So that is making you know you're going to travel with that money you're going to you're going to revenge shop and that's why you get this all this wacky data in the economy it's so obvious jack it's just like cuz half half the half the you know that that top 20% are of people of husbands and wives and children they're doing revenge travel revenge shopping uh they just have extra money that they never had when the fed was suppressing rates never had it before uh in terms of that that incoming interest but the bottom 30% that according to the New York Fed, according to them, not me, the bottom 30% of Americans only have $400 in their checking account for emergencies. Those people are getting annihilated. And that's why in an election year, there's so much pressure on the Fed to cut rates. And that gets back to if they cut rates with inflation starting to bounce, that's going to just drive money. So that's what's going to trigger this colossal migration of capital. One of the biggest trades of our lifetime in when markets speak. Buy the book today on Amazon. Larry, uh, 
the, the final question I want to ask you about is a topic you address in the, the late part of your book about the future of the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency. It, it currently is and, and has been. Uh, foreign countries own a lot of U.S. dollar reserves, foreign exchange reserves, in order to protect their exchange rate. And the dollar is used very frequently uh, as an invoice of trade in oil, oil, for example. That system, with all its blemishes, has held in there and has been uh, a very stable, very persistent, despite uh, you know many people's predictions for like 40 years that it would it would collapse. Uh, what is your view on the future of the U.S. dollar and the uh, U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency? Well, listen, we're not going to. The U.S. is not going to lose its status as the reserve currency in, in our life, probably in my lifetime. I don't know about yours here, Lee Younger. The bottom line is what we talk about in the book is when you use the club, imagine like a bully club of sanctions. Uh, and you're supposed to use this, this club once every 10 years. But when you use it over and over again, you hit multiple cu- countries over the head. Um, it, you just build up a resistance of countries and all the other emerging market countries are looking at you He's hitting those countries over there, build, build the building club. I mean, you take Russian assets. Putin's a bad guy. You know, you're going after oligarchs. You're taking, you're taking Russian, you're seizing Russian, Russian capital. So that's driving people into things like Bitcoin and hard assets. And so you can say that the, the dollar is, has been strong, but the dollar's only been strong because the Fed's holding that front end up, right? Because the, 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 the six month T bill's paying 5%. That's sucking dollars into it, right? But the moment the Fed starts cutting in a, in a multipolar world with high sanctions and everything we're seeing around global trade and, um, and confiscation of capital after you know the, the tragedy in the Ukraine with Russia, the, the dollar is going to come get hammered. And so that's why the dollar is essentially being held up by the Fed. Now, does the dollar lose its reserve currency? No. But remember, the oldest democracies, and this is what we talk about in the final chapters of the book. The old, oldest, like think about Tocqueville and Teitler. Uh, this is you know, Scottish historian, uh, Teitler. You know, he goes back uh, to Tocqueville and Teitler, go back to the 1800s, late 1700s, 1800s. And they looked at democracies. And, and you know what? You look around the world at like, you look at Argentina, uh, you look at Venezuela, uh, Puerto Rico, but U.S. territory. But you can just see there's lots of societies that haven't lasted very long once the, the citizenry figures out that they can drain the public treasury. And you look what's happening in Washington when we're promising people that come into the country for five minutes, you know, a huge goodie bag, right? And so we weren't doing that like 150 years ago. And so if, if, you're, if you're doing that kind of deficit spending and you're raiding the treasury, you're building up the debt to unsustainable levels, you know, that's why democracies, democracies don't, don't last. And the last thing I'll say is the cycles of democracy that Tocqueville and Teitler talked about was countries typically start off in bondage. And right? think about that's where the U.S. was uh, during the Revolutionary War, I mean, where we were un- under, under the thumb of the, the king, uh, you know, in, the, in, in 1773, 4, 5. And then, you know, you work out to patriotism, entrepreneurship, abundance. But then you... As the country flourishes, you come into this, what we call generational problem, where the next generations are not as hungry. They need to be accommodated. Next thing you need to go into complacency and apathy, apathy, and then back to bondage. And this is a cycle that has repeated itself many times in the last, you know, two, three thousand years. And so, and if you look at the United States today, relative to where it was, say, 50 years ago, it's, you can definitely see traces of this cycle. And so eventually, you know, in the next, 50 years, we probably use that. We probably lose that reserve currency status. You see a slow erosion of the dollar, but more in the short to midterm term, uh, you are much more concerned about the level of the dollar relative to other fiat currencies than you are about the relevance of the dollar. In other words, the decline of the U.S. dollar as a reserve currency, that's a very long term story. Short term, you, you're you're a dollar bear, but you don't think that it's you know going to be eroded you know, anytime exactly. soon. Exactly. No, your short term is just... The dollar's been on the high horse for a long time now, for three, two, three years. Um, the Fed's been because the Fed, when remember, one great lesson in investing, we talk about this in the book. There's different ways to, to figure out the dollar. When the Fed is more hawkish or holding up rates relative to the other central banks, that's a big factor in the dollar, and that's what's been happening. Um, but the other factor is if the if the U.S. economy's 
you know, much stronger than the rest of the world. And that was the case, you know, say a year and a half ago, last year, you know, that's also helping the dollar. But but once once the Fed, because it's holding up rates for so long and and hurting, you know, so many people that are in the bottom 60 percent, and once they're forced to cut because of all kinds of things like the regional banks, um, then that the, do- the dollar really gives way pretty quickly. And so, the, so there's two trades. There's the short, the one, two, three year trade of the dollar, and then it's the long term trade of the dollar. And do you think the Federal Reserve will cut more or less than, let's say, the European Central Bank? Because I, I know in the past that the the, the you know, U.S. interest rates were allowed to be higher than Europe, which you know, in some cases, maybe because you know, for reasons we won't get into, is is like l- less productive, um, and uh, uh, J- Japan as well. Um, I mean. Like, do, do you think that, that uh, you know, if the euro is going to strengthen against the dollar, is it because ECB, your European Central Bank, uh, interest rates are higher than the Federal Reserve, or is it for other reasons? Well, hey, listen, the U.S. has a banking system that's more sophisticated. We've got leveraged finance, um, leveraged loans, CLO, all of our financing is more sophisticated than Europe. And that's a huge part of why the U.S. has been a far, far, far superior economy. And our government's been typically less, you know, less big and less onerous than a lot of the European countries. But that's becoming that's becoming less of the fact. But the Fed, the Fed's at a period where the U.S. economy, economy and the banking system is probably more vulnerable now. Um, the, the 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 population in election year is more vulnerable. That's one thing Powell has to deal with. So in an election year with the banking problem, that you know, with the commercial real estate problem and all this debt. You know that's 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 on the bank balance sheets. They, you know, they really have a problem, and they got to get rates down. And I think that's where you could have some some like a year from today, probably at least a hundred bips bips of cuts, and then that gets you a much weaker dollar. And so, do you think the European Central Bank will also have a hundred bips of cuts, or more, or, or less? You know, I think we, I would say probably half of that. Got it. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, uh, Larry, uh, the, the book is uh, How to Listen When, when Market Speaks, uh, Risk, Myths, and Investment Opportunities in a Radically Reshaped uh, Economy. Uh, we will put it on, on stage there. My final uh, question for you, Larry, and I promise you that this is the final one, uh, the, the topic about when markets speak there are, are two ideas in there. One of them is that, you know, I know at, at Bear Trust Report, you've got, what is it, 21 indicators and how you're constantly uh, uh, interpreting what the market is telling you. So that's one idea. You always pay attention to the market. That might be you know, summarized by the, by the short saying, like the, the market is always right or something like that. How do you square that with being able to spot turning points that you know, by definition, you're going to be a contrarian? If, if energy is 3% of the S&P and there's one tech stock, NVIDIA, that's more than that, wouldn't, wouldn't listen to when markets speak to say, hey, actually, you know, th- th- uh, isn't it a version of the efficient market hypothesis and basically it's uh, the market's always right? In other words, you know, how, how can you try and be a contrarian and you know, bottom tick those oil stocks uh, in April of 2020 when they're trading at, at you know, a, f- a few pennies? You know, and how do you be a contrarian while also like, paying attention to what the market is, is speaking to you? Well, the, the first couple things is that when the transports and the banks are not acting well, something's wrong that's listening to the market like that's there's something going on around energy prices and rates that has started to really hamper parts of the u.s economy so everybody's pretty bullish on the u.s economy now but for for my lifetime and every just look back in history when the transports are underperforming the s p by 18 percent, i think over two years and the banks are underperforming by 20 to 40 percent in some cases 50 percent that means there's an interest rate problem in there or an oil problem or inflation problem. Uh, there's, there's something, just look at FedEx, UPS. I mean, just seeing that you're seeing some crazy performance there. And so it's those things tell you that something's wrong in the market. Now in high yield and triple C's, you've got a lot of private credit, private credit bubble right now. And so high yield has not broken down and high yields typically a much the, you know, very good leading indicator on the economy. It's typically one of the best. And so we're not seeing strong signals there yet, but we are seeing strong signals on all the consumer finance plays. Um, any company that faces the bottom 60% or the bottom 50% of consumers, there's just dozens and dozens and dozens of them that have shown tons of stress. 
and tons of problems or just, you know, earnings warning or the CFO is just not comfortable with the guidance. So that's what we mean about how to listen when markets speak. In terms of being contrarian, what we try to do is, you know, we were buying a lot of these uranium names, 2020, 21. We look at bear markets and bear markets typically, that's why we talk call it the bear trap support. Typically bear market rallies fade and fall. In other words, to come on, say, say uranium, the uranium sector, those stocks for years were in this long decline and every rally failed. And so what we look for are those turning points where you're, you're entering a new bull market and we're trying to discover those. And we discover those by talking to clients, talking to people in Washington. Okay, okay, is there a change in energy policy? And then is there a change in the technicals where, you know, all of a sudden, Cameco or NextGen or one of these uranium plays, you know, you know, made that bottom and then is now making lower, uh, higher lows, right, for the first time in a decade. And that's that's what we're looking for is how, when, how to listen when markets speak. Thanks, Larry, for, for coming on. Pleasure to, to uh, speak with you. People can find you um, at uh, Convert Bond on, on Twitter. Hopefully, I'll be able to uh, interact with you again. Uh, my account is having some, some ir- irregularities. Uh, Larry, thanks again, and thanks, everyone, for watching. Thanks, Jack. All the best. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodlfg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. A reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.